Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Page Turners Plus. The last time you heard from us, we were reviewing Jacob Ross's Black Rain Fallen. The next time you hear from us, we'll be reviewing What Storm, What Thunder by Miriam Chansey. But today we have a very special guest with us. We have Jacob Ross himself and we'll be talking more with him. He is, of course, the author of Black Rain Fallen and The Bone Readers, of course. Welcome, Mr. Ross. Hello, hi. Thank you for having me. It's Thank our you. pleasure. <laughs> I'm so excited to have you here with us, Jacob. I'm going to open the, if I may, it's very okay, <laughs> Um, I think I'm going to open up up this morning. Uh, good afternoon or good morning, uh, wherever you are in the world. Hello, everyone. Yeah. Um, so Black Rain Falling is the second in a series uh, of crime novels. And I guess my real question is, why was it important to you that the Caribbean have a kind of crime novel? And on reflection, how do you think it translated the classic crime novel kind of genre into the Caribbean context? Yeah, yeah. thank you. It's a great question. Um, but I think, I think, um, one of the, the the great preoccupations of Caribbean people at the moment is, in fact, crime, and that has been the case for a very, very long, long time. But um, as I say to people when I speak about the idea for the book, it's I was reading um, a roundup of crime novels. I think and that was about two years before I wrote the first in in, in the series, where uh, almost every country on every continent was listed you know with with crime novels what came out during the year what was interesting and not one from the caribbean and i was absolutely i was so shocked in fact i was quite traumatized you know i, I got so upset and I, I and i did a bit of research later on i found one woman who i think is jamaican um who lives in north america and she's written some, you know, a, a, um, a book and so on. But at the time, I didn't realize, that, in fact, nobody, as far as I was concerned, was writing about Caribbean crime in the sense that that satisfied me. I, I'm not a fiction writer. I'm not a crime fiction writer. I wasn't. But I was so worked up. I was so motivated. I decided, OK, if nobody's going to do it, I'm going to do it. Because we've got to be in there. If for the next roundup, we've got to be in there. Interestingly, last year, when the roundup came, yeah, Grenada, not Grenada, the Caribbean was there. And they didn't, they, they, they kind of mentioned, you know, Jacob was, but from the Caribbean, that was what really mattered to me. Yeah, and um, yeah, so that's it. I mean, the Anglo-Caribbean, that is because I know, the, um, in my, is it Martinique, in Guadeloupe, there is a writer, I think he's English, who went, you know, lived there and became, I don't know. Well, I think, I think I've seen Cuban, um... Cuban the Cuba, crime, Cuba, crime yes, Cuba. As well. yeah. Exactly, exactly. Um, the guy who wrote the, I always forget his name, he wrote um, what they call the, the, the Havana series, Havana Quartet. Um, right. So you have Havana Black, Havana Red, Havana, you know. Um, so we, I, for the, but for the English speaking or Anglo Caribbean, as I call it, we didn't have that. And I, and I thought that, you know, it's time that we, we do something. Because it's a very interesting genre, quite legitimate. So, you know, for me, it was important to kind of make a mark, you know, kind of say, and right now there's so many people who are writing me from the Caribbean, Guyana, wherever, saying to me, well, I, I am going to write one, I want to write one, you know, because they saw that it could be done. And they saw in a way how it could be done. So that, that was a, a useful intervention, I think. Um, but your background is in literary fiction. Yes. So one of the questions we have is, is there such a thing as literary crime fiction? It's a and, great question. Yeah. And, and it's a, it's do a, your novels, what, how do yeah. you view your, your novels? How do I reconcile them? To be, I never thought it, um, that what I was writing was literary in any way. I just wanted to write a crime novel. So what I did was, I teach, I teach narrative craft all over the world. I and mean, I do it here at universities, at community groupings and stuff. So I understand how a novel works and I understand how a genre novel works. And I understand the, the, what I call the understructure of the novel. So I literally studied, and I, I, I read quite a few of Raymond, Raymond Chandler's and you know, some in, in my time. And so I, in terms of the, the procedure, the, the ingredients required to write a crime novel, um, and I, and I set about to write it, but I do have um, 
a writing style that people tend to identify as literary. I never saw my work as literary because I, I do think that it, it could be seriously argued, you know, whether or not crime fiction is or is not literary. I think I, I have seen so much, uh, so, um, so much of crime fiction that is, in my view, fascinating, can stand up to a deep analysis, yeah? Uh, because crime fiction does something which I think is it's one of the most immediate and contemporary of, of the genre in the sense that it opens up possibilities and allows you to look at society in a way that is less easy to do with literary fiction. You know, but, but it, there's a rawness to crime fiction. So you can look at the, the, the dirty on the belly of your society, which is what a lot of crime fiction, you know, good crime fiction um, and does anyway. Yeah, it, it, you can interrogate society. You can ask big questions about human nature, about law and justice. And, it, it, you know, my, my book always, my books tend to ask a question uh, or sets up a tension between what is legal and what is fair and what is just. And that's part of the struggle that my character, for example, Digger has, you know. Okay, it's legal. The law says you should do this, but it's not fair. You know, if you go, if you if you if you if you go along with, with, with what the law dictates, and sometimes it's like in the early part of the book, he says sometimes in order to um to what to to fulfill the law, you have to break the rules. You know, that's really part of my argument and stuff. I'll tell you what literary fiction, what people tend to mean by literary fiction. Uh, they tend to 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 mean that the writer pays a lot of attention to the language. Yeah, to, to to the crafting of the language. So when you read this, it, you get a lot of pleasure from the text itself, from reading the text. And also, a literary writer is expected to give more of character, what's happening inside. In other words, what is it that is driving the character? It's, you know, their weaknesses, their strengths, their desires, their longings, their, their lacks, their, you know, all that's the traumas, if you like. So literary fiction is expected to to excavate a lot more where character is concerned and i suspect that that's one of the reasons why they say my book is literary because you know um but so many of the reviews describe the novel as being character driven it's driven by my characters you know that what they do comes from inside of them you know they, they're not out to kill anybody or beat up anybody because they just feel as beating up a man and to give a reader a reader a thrill they do it because they're almost compulsed to do it. Something in their natures make them, for example, you know, who, who is the quickest to pull a gun? Miss Tannis Laws, right? It, especially if it's a man who is transgressing, you know, she will shoot him. In fact, very often, Digger has to protect the, the, the criminal at times because, and why is that? You, you know, what, once you know her history, that this is a, a woman who, as a child, had been seriously, you know, she, she'd been raped by a man. She's been given a child that she does not even know how to love, you know, and so on. When she sees a man treating a woman in a particular way, when she reacts, you know, you remember that, yeah, she, you know, this is how she would react because this is what she has lived through. And she knows what it means to be a woman who has been transgressed, you know, by a man. You see what I'm saying? Digger also, Digger is very protective of women. Yeah, but don't forget that his mother got killed by a policeman. Digger doesn't like police. He's a police, but he doesn't like the police. Why? Because po a, po a policeman kills his mother. So everything is shaped, and that's really what people tend to mean by literary, that, uh, you know, it's, it's grounded in character, and the action flows out of the character. Yeah, and that's why people tend, and, and also the writing, I am, um, I am what um, my friend Bernardino Barista referred to once as a prose stylist. I like that description so much, you know, I never forgotten it. It was about 10 years ago she said that. Yeah, so there you go. Long answers for a short question. <laughs> Francine? 
Yeah, actually, you answered a couple of the other questions. You touched on the fact that you could use the crime, your crime novel to expose things in society. And that's one of the things that I noticed as I was reading. As I was reading, I thought, gosh, yes, it's a crime novel, but here we're, it's, it seems to me like it's, it's a vehicle to expose the societal issues on this post-colonial island. And one of the issues that I picked up on and we, we wanted to ask about was the fact that you describe many of the characters by their skin color. You yes. first, you know, he was dark yeah, skinned yeah. and he was light yes. skinned or yeah. cinnamon colored yeah. and we and, and is yeah. that yeah. one of the societal yeah. issues that you yeah. wanted to touch on in the novel? Yeah, I, I yeah, yes, um certainly. Um and I got that from reading, really reading Tony Morrison. Um and also thinking about um, you know, what Andrew Salkey, who died some time ago, you know, he was a very important Caribbean writer, as you know, when he came to England. And um, Salkey talked about, it, for him, his literary mission as a writer was to dignify his people. Now, for me, that is my manifesto, to dignify my people. And, and, and when I present this wonderful salad of characters, men, women, you know, in all their beauty. I mean, you know, I, I, and you know, I'm doing the shady something, but I'm saying to people, you see, you can do it this way too. Who was Digger's first girlfriend? Digger was into this girl called Lonnie, if you read the first book, very dark skinned. He likes a dark skinned woman. Bessie is cinnamon, yeah, she's beautiful conventionally, but give him Lonnie, you know? And, and, I'm, and, 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 and for him, Lonnie is magical also because of her color. You know, she's, she, he loves her darkness. And, and, and Toni Morrison does that too. I don't know if you've read, um, for example, Song of Solomon, when she describes this character called Pilate, or Pilate, <laughs> Pilate. Pilate, she describes her lips as wine dark. Oh my God, that's poetry, you know? And, and there's a way she's loving the character and saying, you see, she's black. And look at, look at what she's got. Look at the magic she possesses. So, 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 and, and, and um, I have a military novel, um, Pinter Bender, I call it, people call it Pinter Bender. Pinter is a dark skinned guy. He's gorgeous, you know? His girlfriend is very light skinned, Tinel, you know? But she's gorgeous too. So I'm doing that and I'm saying to you that also, the, 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 I'm not going to generalize, but in my reading of a lot of European literature, and that's what most of us have grown up on, you know, my generation and stuff, characters, they, they may have variety, but they are quite monochromatic. You know, is the Caribbean, if there is one thing that the Caribbean is not, is monochromatic, you know? Man, we got shades and color to give away, you know? Um, and, and that is what I'm doing when I, you know, and I hope people doesn't, people don't, read it wrongly and take offense at it but i'm trying to say you know look at it's like a fruit basket of humans you know mango avocado you know guavas you know have a look it's a bouquet of humans do you get me and that's what i'm into i'm there to dignify my people full stop and they get it the european readers they absolutely get it some might go in a huff you know about it but one thing they can say is that as a writer, even when I present them as doing pretty awful things, you cannot deny the fact that I love those people as a writer. They're my people, and I identify with them. Simple. Paula, <laughs> you want to jump in here? Yeah. Um, we, one of the things we noticed is that oppression is, is in, in this novel. You, you deal with oppression. Um, you show it occurring on, on all levels of the society. The children, for example, there are children who are being oppressed by the drug dealers. Um, Juba Hurst oppresses the whole of Kara Island. Um, then, of course, there's the historical oppression of Miss Stanislaus by Juba Hurst. Decima Manil is who is uh, who is upper middle class is oppressed by her husband 
um, so what, 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 well, what I perceive is a pattern of oppression, which it goes through the entire, the whole spectrum of, of, of the society. And I was yeah. wondering what you were, what you were discussing there. What, yeah. what, what, what did you want to, yeah. to show us? So, yeah, it's a wonderful question because again, that's one of my big things, you know, look, Caribbean society is like, what is like what Walter Rodney said, Walter Rodney said, Caribbean plantation um, society was founded on an economy that was designed to kill, meaning that the European plantocracy, when they came, they had worked out, they did a kind of mathematics, especially in Latin America, right? They had a kind of mathematical thing. It's almost like what you do with insurance at the moment. And they decided that if I work this man or this woman for, to death, they will last me 25 years and it's cheaper to work them to death and to buy another batch of slaves than to, you know, than to, to, to look after them and keep them alive. Some people do that, you know, with animals or they used to do it with animals too. That was a calculation, what they already pointed that out. Caribbean society was founded on violence. Caribbean society, is a society from the very beginning, right? The, the early peoples who were there, what I call the um, the um, the first people of the Caribbean, they were wiped out. The Caribbean, as we know it, had its roots in a kind of genocide, okay? And it was replaced by another kind of genocide, which is the bringing of Africans and whatever it is to the Caribbean. Deep a society was constructed on violence and you know what happens we as caribbean people have especially the, the you know the, the the caribbean africans as i call them some people say african caribbean caribbean african we have internalized so much of it you know um and if you if you if you really want to get a sense of how that has become an important preoccupation for for some of our intellectuals, you read George Laming. George Laming was the one who I think personally, I mean, I think Earl Lovelace too, a few others, because Laming always said, you know, that we, the, the decolonization process is not a physical thing. We have gotta do that too, you know? And we know that, you know, others like Franz Fanon have been doing the work on it, but Laming was the one, the Caribbean writer who really, really was preoccupied with that and always felt that we haven't, we haven't got it yet. We don't, we haven't embraced the agenda yet, and it's do that kind of thing. So, when a mother thinks, and I have a short story that that handles that. When a when a mother, a woman thinks that it's some kind of social, she gets some kind of social cach cachet by taking her daughter or her son, bringing him out in the yard pulling out a timbre and whip or a belt and cutting his ass, right? When she thinks, when a woman thinks that if my man don't box me or slap me, he don't love me. You understand? When, when, um, when, uh, when, as happened in Grenada, uh, it's an insight I, I, I kind of came upon because I'm researching this book I'm researching at the moment, um, where people tend to, people tend, they're so ready to respond emotionally rather than rationally to stuff. So if somebody offends, offends, offends me, rather than offend them back or just turn my back on them, I want to cough them down. You know the expression coughing down. When you have situations where people, are, they, 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 we have not learned the skills of negotiation. This is what I, I, I've always said was the problem with the Grenada Revolution when they killed each other off. 1983. These guys never learned the simple, elegant, necessary thing of negotiation. You don't agree with this person, you negotiate. You don't fall back on violence. Yeah, you don't do the thing that society has always taught you to do, right? And how did they settle it? In a classic historical Caribbean sense, they put nine of their colleagues, including the prime minister, up against a wall and executed them. Yeah. 
And that is what we have to fight against. You know, the whole idea, you know, a man, you know, he, he, his wife or his woman gets him vexed. He wants, he wants a boxer. You want to hit her. You want to beat her because he feels he has the right to do it. That is, that is, that, dare I say, is not just a Kamaho thing. That's a Caribbean thing. Yeah. And that, and that is something, that is something which I think that we have to address, you know, and in my writing, all the time it's there. Why? Because I lived through it. So in my book, it is all about violence. And also, if you look at Desi and her husband, Desi is posh. She's nice. I like her. Um, very much actually. But 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 I'm showing you that that violence doesn't only happen, you know, with ordinary working class folks. You go all the way up there, you know, money doesn't make a difference. Wealth doesn't make a difference. The same kind of prerogative that a man feels he has over a woman, you know, be he uh, a guy who goes out there and cut grass to make a living, and the one who has the, the big house with the lawn and the orchard at the back of his house, he, he is still Grenadian or still Caribbean, and he behaves exactly like the one that he thinks he's, who, who he thinks he's better than. That's really what it's about. And we need to confront it. I I think I'm going to cede here to Kesu so she could ask her question about the Grenada Revolution, just because it comes on the heels of what you just said. Yeah. Kesu. <laughs> Thank you so much uh, for those thoughtful comments. Um, and I think one thing that really jumped out at me with this novel was how the Grenada Revolution is really woven both into the background consistently, but at times it really comes to the forefront of the story as well. It becomes important. Um, and it was unusual, I think, for me. I wasn't expecting it, rather, because the novel set in a in a fictional space, Kamaho, rather than the physical, real Grenada. And I just kind of wondered, why did you think? What? Why did you make that choice? Why did you do that? Um, yeah. Why? Yeah. Why was it that it was in the in the realm of the imaginary? Perhaps the revolution becomes a more palatable story, or or more relatable, or more real. Anyway, more believable. Um, nice. <laughs> yeah. Nice one. Nice good. 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 Um. What's, one is because um, the reason why I'm in England is because of what happened, the violin. You know, I was, I was, um, I, a lot of people don't know this, but I was the director of cultural affairs in my country. I run a whole ministry. You know, I was responsible for cultural development when this thing happened. I came to England because I came, the Americans invaded Grenada in 1983. I left in 1984 to come to England. The only reason why I'm here in England is precisely because living in Grenada under the administration, the American, American rule was untenable. And my mother, my sister, my brother, everybody wanted me to get out because they know me well enough to know that I don't put my mouth in bully to speak. I will speak out, I will object. And also the Americans were very keen to get young, bright people out of the country because we were the potential you were the revolutionaries, you were the potential danger. So they they'd offered scholarships to a lot of the people who returned to run the country in the 1990s. I came here, England, and I moved in. And now there's a time when I went to Grenada. Um, that was about 10, 11 years after I stayed in England because I stayed away for a long time and upset my family really badly because I was silent for a long time. When I returned, I'd written one book. It's a very small collection of short stories called Song for Simone, and it was banned. Um, they would not allow me and the other Grenadian writer that you all may have heard of, Merle Collins. We could not read in a public space. We were not allowed to read in a public space, so like public library, you know? We had to go to this place, the extra rural department of the University of the West Indies, and one very interesting woman called Beverly Steele, she is a historian who gave us the opportunity to read from our books of poems and short stories for the public. So to answer your question, that, and that has been my great trauma. Um, it's never left me. What I am today is directly a result of that. Um, the whole island was traumatized. Um, and I mean the word seriously now because I don't know, you, you, you're, you're, you're young, it's about 40 years now, but more, but the Grenada Revolution represented for a lot of Caribbean people, especially the Caribbean left, the hope 
Some people hated it, the middle classes. But people saw a real, it's like, you know, the, this is this is the way to negotiate our our way out of a certain kind of dependence. Let, let, let me give you an example, right? Um, they had their faults. They had a lot of, there's a lot of problems going, going down there too, eh? A lo loads of issues going down there too. But let, let me let me show you what happened in Grenada over that period of time. Between 1979, and I wasn't in the country, I was in France, I was studying, and 1983, um, education, education was free. Education became free. Health was free. Don't, they didn't have the, the resources, but health was free. They introduced the, the um they introduced um pension, a kind of a minimum wage. They had a ministry of women's affairs run by a woman minister, right? And the population moved from the population moved from a literacy rate of about 72% or something like that to 96%. The only island in the Caribbean that had such a high ratio was Barbados. Yeah. And um in other words, Grenada, Grenada educational level was the equivalent of Britain at the time, you know, at the end of that, you know, the literacy rate of, of a country. So it represented some kind of, and that is what was destroyed. You know, forget about the killing of the prime minister and, and, and you know, his lover and um, six other, other men. You know, we had factories, you know what I mean? I think the St. Lucians took it. Who was the Prime Minister of Dominica at the time? Was it Eugenia Charles? Yeah, Saint Dominica took it. They took the factories. That was that was reparation. That was Eugenia, Eugenia Charles. Literally, we had we had a, we had an industry where we where we we, we made um we made neck you know all the mango that fall and spoil on the ground and go over and stuff. We found a way to 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 make nectar, tin them, put them in, and sell them. That's what that's what you think we did. And when the Americans came, they, 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 all of that was destroyed. A lot of it was dismantled, and it went to, I think it's to Dominica, I think it was, um, Eugenia Charles. I don't know what, she, what, what they did with it, but Grenada's little industrial base was shifted and taken over there. So that's what we lost, yeah? Um, and that's why, that's why I, I, when, when I go to Grenada now, there's a kind of amnesia. Grenada doesn't want to talk about it. They don't want to, it's like, you know, like with slavery. You saw, if you talk to the average Caribbean person about slavery, they say, oh, that's a, they don't want to talk about it. You know, even if you show them the fact that it's, it's the past, but it's still very present in terms of the way we behave, in terms of our attitudes to women, you know, our attitudes to human sexuality, you know, all that stuff. This, they don't want to hear it. In Grenada, there is a kind of willful amnesia where people don't want to remember it because it had been so, 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 so uprooting. And, 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 and um, that's what my next book is about. My next book is a book that's based on that, that sits right there. So I'm preoccupied with it and it crops up in my writing. But also, it's true that Digger would, his mother would be part of that revolutionary. She would have been part of that process. Very few would have been quite progressive, you know, and as as most Grenadians still are, they're very progressive. You, you know, there's certain things you, you just don't, you know, the kind of liberties that people in Barbados and Antigua, that these foreigners take with, with the locals, they can't do that in Grenada. Grenadians will just will run them out of the country as they did with a guy called Bromlow, an, an Englishman decided to, to block the beach and he owns the beach and we can't go on the beach. Within two weeks, he was back in England, Lord Bromlow. Do you understand? Some time ago, the prime minister, but he's out now, tried to sell um, a park that bordered on the beach that Grenadians love, a little park, you know, for kids to run around in, to sell it off to some developer. Within five days, he had to retract. He had to say that he, he never ever, that was a mistake, he never intended, or was on one of his ministers who, who they, you know, because he knew, you know, fire going to burn him. Thank you so much for that answer. Yeah, in terms of the the whole uh, what you described as amnesia, I, I think it came across in Black Rain Falling and in the Bone Readers as well, because here's Digger fighting for answers into what happened to his mother. And I think it was Chillman who just sort of told him, you know, you should kind of forget about that. Don't get anybody angry. Um, yeah. Let bygones be bygones. It's water yeah. under the bridge. I think that, was that sort of you 
hinting at what might be happening in Grenadian society? Yeah, I mean, what are the Grenadas, um, Grenadas, Grenada's greatest um, problem which Grenada doesn't acknowledge, I think, is, is the missing body. Let me explain to you what I mean by that. Um, the first rebel, Grenada has, Grenada, has, Grenada has always been quite a rebellious little island. Yeah? Um, the, 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 it took the Europeans a hundred years before they could even set foot on the island. You know, because the natives there, <laughs> the people there, just wouldn't let them land, right? But they eventually landed, okay? And um, not long after, just after the French Revolution, um, they, 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 in 1790, something, 72, I don't remember. Um, Haiti, with Toussaint Louverture and that lot, decided that, they're gonna go. They're gonna follow the French, you know, Egalité, Liberté, Fraternité, and Liberté, Fraternité, and they decided they're gonna. They wanted their independence too. So the Haitians is uh, put up a fight against the French. You know, keep that in mind. And two years later, 1795, there's a guy in a Grenadian guy called Fedon, Julien Fedon, decide he's gonna do the same thing as the Haitians do. So we had the first real revolution in Grenada in 1795. And, but he, and he, he fought the British for one year. The only reason why he lost that war is because he was not able to capture St. George's, or else our history would have been very different. So it's an island that, that, that has always been quite, you know, very much like that. In, in, in the 1950s, we had another revolution with this guy who came in and turned out to be a dictator in the end, but he was very important to Grenada, a guy called Eric Gary. And, and Gary, um, Gary was the one who introduced unionism, wage labor, Right, he destroyed the whole system of serfdom. You know, where people work, you know, for these the, you know, the kind of absentee um, plant. And then, of course, in 1979, another revolution. So we're gonna we have we have a fair share of that, you know, um, and uh, and that is the proud history that they have tried to 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 to, to make Grenadians forget. But what they do not realize is that it's in the blood. So, so take, for example, let me give you an example. There, there are several important sites in the country which are of great symbolic importance to Grenadians. They don't even know it, but it's there. It's the place where Morris got, quote unquote, indicted to be killed. It's a house that overlooks the harbor. Yeah. Um, what did the last prime minister do? He decided to build the House of Parliament on top of that, right? It's a kind of erasure, right? They also, um, they decided to conflate. I think it was, um, the, I think it's, I can't remember exactly, but one important day, you know, that we celebrated for the, during the revolution to conflate that with what they call independence the day the Americans arrived. Oh, in other words, trying to wipe away all the old, you know, old important psychological symbols by canceling them out with, you know, and that is not his idea. He's not bright enough to come up with that. You know, it's his American advisors, you know, the State Department, CIA or whatever, or whoever it is, they are the ones who advise him to do that. But in other words, to tamper with the profound hard-earned symbols of Grenadian-ness, yeah, and by, by replacing them or, or distorting them or, you know, or whatever, you know, that's what they do. I've, I'm, I'm going to jump in here if I may and ask another question mm. if I can. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, when I asked the question about the Grenadian Revolution, it was because it felt so present in the novel, but so kind of like a scepter almost in the background, sometimes coming to the fore. And the way you talk about it with such passion and depth and knowledge, and obviously because of your role that I didn't know about, but I did wonder if that 1984 date, because I think it's quite clear that you arrived in England in 1984 and that, yes. it, you know, it, there was, a, yeah. I did wonder if that was related to the yeah, end of the course. revolution. Um, I do kind of, I, I, the other question I want to ask you is, you mentioned another book uh, where you might feature the revolution. Would that be another, would that be another book in the series, uh, the crime series, no. or would that be a separate? No, that's book se that? separate. That, that's book two to the um, the first literary novel I wrote um, called Painter Bender. Um, 
and um, you should read it. You should uh, read what, or if you don't read it, read what John Lee, John, you know John Lee? John R. Lee, I think he's St. Lucian. He does all that sort of stuff. Go and read, you know, hear what he says about the book. Um, it didn't, it didn't take off. It came off. It came out the wrong time. The publishers who didn't, um, I don't think that they were ready for a book like that. Uh, uh, you know, and you know, somebody who um, read it recently told me basically that the book, you know, it was long. It was at, a, at least a decade before its time. But it's worth reading it because it gives you a sense of what it meant to be. Uh, well, all the islands would have experienced that. It's 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 just that it's, it's it's that period in our history when we, as a people, were just about to step into the twentieth century, you know, to move out of, you know, the 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 nineteenth century. And all that meant, you know, the kind of serfdom. Where, where when you had in the Caribbean, you had monocultures, you know, like for example, Dominica. You all had was it Rosso? Where you all had, you know, um, sugar cane, sugar cane for some parts and bananas for you know, and all of that went to England, right? You know, th th these you know, sugar cane for the sugar and the rum, until they needed it no more because it was replaced by beetroot. Um, wh wh when the Caribbean was a plantation, whose sole economic structure was to feed. The, the 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 needs and the resources to feed um of the, the colonizing powers yeah there was a time when the caribbean was that when when in fact um they were, when we had what we call monocultures when the dominant crop was a crop that the people in the island couldn't in the islands could not use when, when, when for example you know you, you in grenada we, we we grow the some of the best cocoa in the world you know that's a fact it's not a boost Jamaica, some of the best coffee in the world. But we, we can still go in the shop to buy a bottle of coffee or to buy Ovaltine or Milo. Do you understand? Be because because we, we could not make the connection between the raw cocoa we produced and put on the ship belonging to Geist Industries with, with the cocoa that we that, that we grow. You understand? Um, and, 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 and we moved out of that. That was a period when when we broke out of that completely, the Caribbean, right? And and you have to go back to leaders like Eric William, Burnham in um, Guyana, the, is this Bustamante or Manly in, in in Jamaica? Those were the those are the ones who literally broke us out of that, and that was the beginning of independence, which England didn't give us. We took Francine, <laughs> you want to jump in here as we're starting to come to the end? I, I just wanted to say that I actually have read Pinta Bender. I read it many years ago and okay. I plan to reread it. And I have been encouraging the group to read it as well. Um, yeah, that's all I wanted to say, Mal Jay. Yeah, it's a slow, it's a slow book, but you take your time with it. It's not it's not a book written, you know. It's a book written for. It's the kind of book you have to you have to immerse yourself in. You can't go reading it as though you want a strong plot or whatever it is. But it's a book that says it's a song to the Caribbean and to Grenada. It's it's a book that says this is where we've come from. This is who we were. This is what we aspired towards. This is what happened on the way. Yeah, and this is where we are now. I, I just had one sort of brief question based on the novel and how it was written because um, I'm, I'm I'm from Saint Kitts and Nevis. Um, okay. I, I naturally speak a Creole, but reading right. the novel, um, it, it came it came naturally to me. But I realized in terms of the spelling of some of the Creole words, yeah. they, were quite, they were quite unique, and and I've never seen such spelling before. So I was wondering whether you devised that yourself, or maybe that's a Grenadian thing that I'm just not familiar with. No, it's there's the hardest part of the book to write, and in a way, it's what people buy the book for and what people reject the book for. There's a kind of reader out there who they don't want to hear, they don't want to read it. If for them, it has to be in standard English, right? In fact, for a couple of for some of them, the book the character has to be white, 
yeah, because they can't imagine a, a black Mr. Slaughter or a black digger, you know. There are people who are like that. That's the that's is what they call it, what you call the default. And I'm planning to do a whole kind of semiological analysis um, with my students on that. People who they just do not want to identify or emotionally or to bring themselves into an imagined space where there are people who are not like them and more specifically the black people there are people there and you know and sometimes they don't even know why sometimes they don't but but having said that there are again and many many of them are english actually because some of them there's some of the best readers you find probably in the world are some of the english readers i'm talking about white english yeah who loved they loved the difference they love the they love the opportunity to get into a space that you know they would not Otherwise, I've had the opportunity to to enter, you know. And some of my best, some of the best readers of my book are are, are um, white middle class English people. That's a fact, you know. Um, for, about the language, the Creole language, it's the hardest thing. And all Caribbean writers who write, especially you know, for a hybrid audience, have that difficulty. If you you read um, some of the notes that. That um, Sam Selvon made to himself, um, you know, I have had conversations with with a few of them. Um, even Lamming, I remember many many years ago, he came to to Grenada, and I spent some time with him. And and he just said to me, "That's the big question. Ask yourself, what language shall I write in? Because unlike um, Saint Lucian Creole and Martinican Creole and Guadeloupean Creole, it's not written down. We have not codified it on the page, you know." The, the, the Anglo-Caribbean Creole is not written, we, so we don't have a standard that, that we need to follow. We, we, what, what we do is give approximations of how it sounds or how it might sound. So we tend to write phonetically, not phonetically, phonemically, as opposed to you know writing the phonetics of the language, the orthography. I have a friend who just just a couple of days sent me a note asking me, um, you know, to have a look at their work based on because they're writing Caribbean Creole and they they're having issues with it. Some of them have managed a nice fit, you know, they kind of do a, ma a marriage between English and, I mean, I think the writers who really achieve this really well and don't seem to have a problem are people like Ingrid Persaud. I think she's, you know, people love her book. And, um, and, um, and, uh, Ayana, Ayana Gideon Lloyd, nobody seems to have a problem with, 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 with her style, as we say, the way she does it. Um, so maybe I have to go and study what they did. You know, and see how they did it because people, some of them have, some of them have issues, man. Mm. Like you, Raul. They seem to have, find it difficult. I mean, no, I find it easy. Just say it out loud. And, yeah. oh, just say it out loud. Mm -hmm. Or listen to the audio book. <laughs> thank you very much for that one. Uh, just mm -hmm. one very brief final question. What man, are you I'm reading already. right now? <laughs> What am I reading right now? Um, Present View. By Celeste yeah. Mohammed. Yes, by Celeste yes. Mohammed. It recently won yeah. the um, Bocas um, Lit Fest Prize. Well, thank you very much uh, for this interview. Mm -hmm. um, and to end, we're going to have a reading by Jacob Ross himself. Would oh, you yes. stay tuned? And we look forward to seeing you the next time. This is. um. An extract um, from Black Rain Falling, and this is where my main character, Digger, he's, the night before, he's arrested a policeman who ran over a woman and didn't stop, you know, because the police officer was drunk. And um, he just kept driving until somebody stopped him. Um, and people were absolutely, you know, really, really, very angry about it. Now, this is not a made up scene. This actually happened um, when I was in the Caribbean, in Grenada a few years ago. This this, this is a, a woman, a, a real woman and whatever. And Digger, my main character, he is coming down from visiting a friend. You know, he's coming on the road, traveling, driving from visiting, visiting a friend in another parish. And he, 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 he comes up on this accident and he got so angry at this policeman 
who was run over a woman and didn't stop the vehicle. And when the guy asked him, well, how come he didn't stop? The guy found out that the guy is drunk, one. And two, the, 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 the policeman said he thought it was a dog. And so the guy, what the guy did, the guy arrested him. He, that's the, his fellow officer. He arrested the guy. The guy was drunk. Dragged him over, you know, to 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 um to the to, to the police station, put him in, in the in the cell, and then locked him up in there and took the key home. At nine o'clock exactly, I received a call from Staff Superintendent Gill of San Andrew Central Police Station. He demanded the keys up to the cells in the building. Didn't I know that a police officer never arrested another officer in public, no matter what they did? And they certainly didn't lock them up overnight and take away the keys. Where did I get my training? He asked. Who the hell did I think I was? Detective Constable Dixon, sir, I said. San Andrews CID, two years serving, and I'm asking you to read the report I left with your duty officer before you start to insult me. That's no excuse, he snapped. I want the keys. When you're bringing it in? When I'm ready, I replied and hung up. I left my house at 11 a.m., the jail keys in my pocket. I took the long road to the office in St. Andrews. Chief Officer Malan called. I didn't pick up. Five minutes later, Officer Admin Pet texted me. Where are you? I didn't reply. The Chief Officer phoned again. I ignored him. Then Mr. Stanislaus's number popped up. Good morning, Mr. Stanislaus, I said. How are you? Mr. Digger? She said, you asking for trouble? No. Why you lock up the policeman? He killed a woman last night, Mr. Stanislaus. Drunk driving and he's not getting away with it just because he's an officer. I didn't know, she said. You planning to fight them? That's for the family of the victim to do. Ask Pet to get a lawyer who's prepared to take the case on a no-win, no-fee basis. All right, I'll give petty details when I get in. Send the details now, Miss Hannes Law said, and a whole tone had changed. Mm -hmm.